where he wrote to a waterfowl. Hmm. Uh, but all of that, the, uh, and the, the whole thing, the high school athletics and the, then going on to Eureka College and for much of the same thing. It was a, it was a wonderful way to grow up in a time and a community where, believe it or not, I never saw a key uh, to our house. Uh, and I don't know of anyone that did lock their houses. I've been asked this to ask you, if you had any college in the country today, why did you pick Eureka College? Well, when I was, again, a small boy, and after we uh, moved to Dixon, the minister's son, the church that we attended, was a great high school football star, fullback. And uh, he went to Eureka College, and that sort of planted the idea in my mind. I was quite, a, uh, quite imbued with hero worship at the time. And then it didn't hurt a bit when uh, the girl that I was going with later on in high school and who was the daughter of the then minister of the church. Uh, she and her older sisters, they went, and then uh, she was going to Eureka. And uh, So I went to Eureka. What did you gain at Eureka in your mind <clears throat> that you could have possibly taken with you later on through your very careers? Well, I just have to say that that experience has lived so rich in my memory. It's hard to describe why, and yet I think very much that everything good in my life began there. And if I had it to do over again, I'd go to the same place. It was as I said in a biography once that I wrote, it was everything that you thought about in an image of college. Uh, rich in tradition, small, beautiful campus, ivy-covered buildings for real. And uh, it was during the depths of the Depression. And what did you take away from there? Well, I saw the faculty of that little school, which was so hard hit. Of course, all schools like that live in a kind of a genteel poverty, but when you had uh, an endowment, as schools do have, that zeroed and plummeted the way uh, stocks and securities did in the Great Depression, you had a faculty that was went for months at a time without any pay didn't complain and didn't shirk their duty and were in class every day doing what they were supposed to do. Uh, and the townspeople in this small college town uh, carried them on the books and with complete trust and confidence that everything would come out all right as it did. Uh, it, was, it wasn't just that you learned something in a, in a classroom, it was the entire experience. But you, there's one thing about a small school, you can't hide. Uh, and it brings out uh, talents and abilities in everyone because you need everyone. It isn't like some of the large universities today where you can go there and be totally anonymous, except for maybe a small circle of friends. And uh, some student that might have come to college with no intention of ever doing anything but going to class. Uh, you needed them when there were committees for homecoming ceremonies and so forth, or whether it was for athletics or any of the other functions, extracurricular activities. You went out and so students were drafted into these things and found horizons broadened and found themselves able to do things that they never would have attempted. And it was all born of the need that a school that small, everybody's got to pitch in and do something. Fifty years ago this weekend, and it may not be this weekend, maybe you remember the date more than I, you went through graduation. Saturday, Sunday, you're going to be back at Eureka yes. College seeing the graduation again. Fifty years later, 
in that time you've gone on to an actor, a governor, and ultimately the president. This is your first visit back to Eureka, I believe, since becoming president. You did campaign there in October. That's right. Yes. I have visited back at the campus many times in the past. As a matter of fact, 25 years ago, I spoke at graduation there. Also, there was some kind of chain. What? Somebody, I saw There's somebody. the ivy chain. Ivy right. chain, that's it. And as far as I know, uh, this will still be part of the ceremony in which, uh, with a chain of real ivy, all of the seniors, uh, the chain is cut between them as they go their separate ways. It's, as I say, it's rich in tradition. What will be your feeling going through that ceremony again 50 years later and realizing what's happened in your life since the moment you picked up your diploma there? Well, actually, uh, what I'll try to express is my gratitude to that place because maybe what's happened in my life wouldn't have happened without the experience I had there. If you could, and this is somewhat of a difficult question, Describe Ronald Reagan for me. Oh, <laughs> uh, that, I don't know that that's possible. Uh, six feet one, uh, <laughs> 185 pounds of uh, brown hair, still have my own teeth, and, uh, and I do not wear makeup do not. when I dye my hair. In fact, I didn't wear makeup when I was in pictures. But I know you wanted more of a different description than that, but I wouldn't know. Uh, you can't possibly draw up some sort of a, if someone said to you, Mr. President, I want five words that describes your personality. And I, I, I'd leave, Doc McKenzie asked you that. So. <laughs> no, I'd leave, I'd leave that to someone else. What was it like growing up during the Depression, during that time in Dixon? Well, remember the Depression hit uh, after my graduation from high school, that's due to the Great Crash in 29. And up until then, uh, actually, we had been through something in the Roaring Twenties, uh, uh, not nearly as draconian as we're going through here, but the, there had been inflation and there had been the, the boom of the, of the 20s. But uh, the, the, the crash, uh, you know, came all at once on that Black Friday in, in October. And uh, then at the college in that first year, you became immediately aware of, of the, well, everyone did. And, and in going through college in those years, uh, there, was, there was a drabness to uh, life in general. It even turned out that, uh, believe it or not, that the automobile industry, uh, all cars, there was no choice of colors. They were all painted black. It was more economical. They could bring them out uh, at a lower price if they did that. You saw a colored car, of, Anything other than black, you knew it was an old one. But it was, uh, it was very, it was constantly on your mind. You were aware all the time of this, this drag and, and the, uh, the, there were not, there were no things such as unemployment insurance and so forth that have, uh, could ease a thing of, like a refreshing, a recession now. You had suddenly 25% of the workforce unemployed. And uh, in my own hometown of Dixon, which actually has some, uh, some manufacturing and industry, the wire screen company, the largest board and milk plant in the world was there at the time, a great Sandusky cement plant. And literally overnight, uh, they were just terminated. And suddenly the fathers of the kids you knew were unemployed. My own father uh, was had a, a kind of a work financial partnership. He did the work and someone else had financed a shoe store. He managed a, a shoe store and hung on for a while, but uh, before we were out of college, uh, that went, the shoe store was gone. And uh, he went from 
number of jobs to uh, sometimes a traveling salesman on the road uh, with straight commission. Uh, you had to sell or, or you couldn't buy gas to get to the next town. And uh, then finally, after the 32 election, uh, when our little Republican community went Democrat, and we were Democrats then, uh, he was uh, given a job in charge of what was called relief, not welfare, relief. And it, uh, he shared an office with the county supervisor of poor, and they shared one secretary, and that was the entire welfare bureaucracy in that town. And uh, it, they didn't receive checks, they received a kind of a script similar to food stamps, and also, uh, every week when they came in for this, the people who were dependent on it, and as I say, these were our friends and the fathers of the kids I'd gone to school with, uh, they would be given maybe produce that the government had been able to buy a surplus, and it could be potatoes or it could be oranges from California or any one of a number of things, and that would uh, uh, supplement their, their script that they could take to the stores. And yet, in all of that, there was a camaraderie. Uh, there were no such things as status symbols anymore. Uh, anyone that got, could do any kind of work uh, would do it and uh, never think that they were doing anything menial or demeaning to themselves. But there was a, a helpful spirit among people and a lower crime rate than we have in times of prosperity. Ever <clears throat> in that time of growing up in Dixon and or Eureka, did you ever dream, I guess every little boy dreams of becoming a president, but did you ever dream it, and if so, when? You know? No, as a matter of fact, holding public office was as far from my mind throughout my entire life up until along about 1965 as it could possibly be. Now, I became interested in public affairs, and I think that was an inheritance from Eureka, from that society where you all had to pitch in. So when I became a, an actor and had some box office draw, uh, I would try to campaign for people I believed in, for causes I believed in, being able to attract an audience. And uh, so I, I, I believed in that kind of involvement. But it was after I had made a speech on the national network for Barry Goldwater in 64 that people came to me and uh, began talking about the governorship and I dismissed them out of hand and said, no, you pick the candidate and I'll go campaign for him. And uh, they kept after us till the place that Nancy and I couldn't sleep. And finally, uh, we asked ourselves, uh, because they kept putting on the basis that with the party all torn apart as it was, that, that we could win and bring everything together there. And we finally were asking ourselves, what if they're right? And that was the first time, and I grudgingly yielded, not through any ambition to have that kind of a career or life. And I sometimes think that I'd never thought beyond the election, that they stressed winning so much that when I finally said yes, I kind of had a feeling it'd all be over in November. And it was only after I got into campaigning that I said, wait a minute, <laughs> I'll have the job. <laughs> I'm sure you're quite aware Northern and Central Illinois consider you somewhat of a, a son or something. You're, you're the president there, but they also remember Dutch this, Dutch that, I remember Dutch. And of course the stories come out after you become a president. One that's come out is your rendition of a, scoring a touchdown against Illinois State. Apparently, you played offensive guard, right? Yep. You apparently, I don't know how you got the ball or what happened, if it was a fumble or what, but everyone tells me for you to tell that story. Well, I didn't make the touchdown. Oh, you didn't make the touchdown. In my last three years of college football, I averaged all but two minutes of every game. <laughs> and you played both ways, offense and defense. And I was about the lightest guy in the line and usually outweighed by the fellow opposite. And it so happened that we were one point ahead. You remember who you were playing by chance? What? You remember who you were playing? Yes, Illinois State Normal. Oh, that's right. Yes. 
right there in your hometown. Yeah. And uh, we were one point ahead. And so they started throwing bombs, passes all over the field. And I had kind of on my own developed a defensive tactic that I thought be trying to rush the passer from in there in the center of the line of guard. And we didn't have, we had a weak pass defense. We were always getting clobbered with passes. And one of the reasons was our whole backfield, there wasn't anyone in the backfield that was over about five feet nine. So they could have their man covered, but he could reach up above them and get that pass. So what I'd done was I would check my man if I thought it was gonna be a pass check my man on the line, and when I saw him fading back or out for a pass, I would turn and go out into the flat zone, into the secondary on pass defense. And that, my senior year, I intercepted a few passes. Well, on this particular day, I started, and as I went over, I realized, looking back at our secondary, everyone had been sucked over one side of the field, and there was one lone Illinois state normal receiver angling down the field all by himself. And I started after him. And I was behind him and I saw by the look in his face as he was looking back that the ball must be coming. And at the last second I turned and went up in the air and caught the ball. But by this time, with only about a minute to play, and there we were over on the side of the field and way down there about, on about the 20 yard line, our 20 yard line, the goal 80 yards away. Just coming down with that ball in my hands, I realized I didn't have what it took to start running for that goal line. <laughs> and I thought if I kind of juggle the ball for a minute as if I'm getting control of it, he'll tackle me and the game will be over and I won't have to run. <laughs> and he didn't. And suddenly I'm juggling and no one has touched me and I started to straighten up and with this, he just put his arms around me and said, tag, you're it. <laughs> and. I could hear the crowd laughing because <laughs> I hadn't gone any place. If, if I'd have been smart enough, I'd have fallen down. And uh, believe it or not, with only seconds to go, I saw a substitute coming in for me, Coach Ralph McKenzie, uh, who took the game very seriously, met me at the sideline. <laughs> and he said. wanted to know what happened. And all I could say was, I'm tired. <laughs> But that was my chance at a touchdown that I, I never made. What they may have been talking about, though, was the audition that was given me when I tried to get a job in radio and got the job, this time after being turned away from I don't know how many stations. I was hitchhiking around all northern Illinois and Chicago and everything. I, I was in Davenport, Iowa, WOC, and the program director for the first time, I mentioned sports, that I was interested in being a sports announcer. I'd never said that before. I just had said, I want a job in a radio station, doing anything. And he caught up with me before I got to the elevator and said, what was that? And I told him. He took me in a studio and stood me up in front of a microphone, said he'd be in another room listening, and when the red light went on, I was to start broadcasting an imaginary football game. Well, we had a game in my senior year against Western State, Norma Macomb in which we won in the last 20 seconds with a 65-yard run. Now, my position in that run was that I, was, I came out of the line and led the interference as a running guard, and my target was the first man in the secondary, and the play didn't work very well if you didn't get that first man. Well, in reality, I missed him, but our quarterback, Bud Cole, and went the 65 yards for the touchdown. I've never known how, but I can assure you that in that, I chose that game so I have to have names that I could remember to talk about, and I chose that as the imaginary game I'd broadcast. I assure you, I got the man in the secondary, the most beautiful block <laughs> that I described eloquently <laughs> in that rebroadcast. What is it like, so I can generate a little interest back home, what is it like going back to Eureka now after all this, these experiences you've had? Oh, it was wonderful. It, as I say, the. And I don't think it's just true of me. I think, I know certainly the, the era that I was there, uh, uh, those graduates who will come back for that 50th anniversary, uh, it has always been a, an important part of their lives. And to go back there now and uh, be the commencement speaker, but I, I'm already 
sensing the atmosphere out. The weather better, better be good because it's, it's warm. In my there. mind, it's a sunshiny day. It is. Uh, but uh, it's, no, it's always been, as I say, close to my heart and, uh, and a wonderful feeling to be asked back. I think any commencement speaker, however, is a little scared because you know <laughs> from your own memory, and of course the young people don't realize that that many years later you remember that well, but from my own memory, I, I remember your reaction to commencement speakers as a kind of a necessary evil that you had to put up with. Now you're the evil. Huh? Yes. One more, maybe? I close okay. Quick. Another rumor going around <clears throat> is that you and fellow Teeks on Friday nights used to go to Roanoke, Illinois. And this is apparently during the Prohibition era. You are now going to attempt to deny or confirm a rumor. The rumor is that uh, that's where you guys picked up moonshine to take back to the fraternity. <laughs> <laughs> well, in those Prohibition days, forbidden sweets, there is no question but that uh, there were some trips and that was the town where it seemed to be available. Uh, I never made such a trip uh, at any time. Uh, in the first place, I never had the transportation. The only ones that could do that were those that uh, did have some. And, and usually the transportation, well, as a matter of fact, the transportation always belonged to those students who were from Eureka because the college, as most schools did in those days, uh, had a rule that you could not come to college with a car. And uh, I'm not sure that it's a bad idea uh, that we shouldn't still follow. But uh, no, it, transportation wasn't allowed, but so there were uh, some, we call them the town students, that uh, lived there and could get the family car. But uh, yes, there was, there was some experimenting again, and as I say, it was against the law and all, and uh, you uh, ex thought you were being real devilish and doing something of the kind, but actually, since it would have meant expulsion from school if it had ever been found, uh, it was not too common, mm -hmm. and it was a, uh, an adventure that maybe occasionally took place, but you were well aware of the risks. So you're denying it? Uh, I, ne I never, honestly, never made one of those trips. Okay. Yeah. First place, I would also add, not only not having the transportation, I wouldn't have been able to buy anything. <laughs> I washed dishes and uh, uh, deferred half my tuition, and ended up having to borrow. I, I went through school uh, totally without any outside uh, family help. There was none. And every summer I would save, uh, because I had a seven day a week job uh, that took you well into bedtime, uh, because as you know in the Midwest, people go swimming in the evening after dinner. and. Uh, so I couldn't spend anything. I was there seven days a week, so I'd, I'd have a couple of hundred dollars saved that I could go back to school with. Had a half scholarship uh, as for half tuition as a needy student, and also I think helped along because I played football. Well, I think they're giving us the sign. Mr. President, I am extremely honored to uh, be able to sit here and chat with you like this, especially realizing that all the Worldly and nationally events well, will continue to go on. And that, well, this has been a trip down memory lane. Yeah. I've, I've appreciated well, it. Well, I hope you have a good time there this weekend. I know they're all looking forward yeah. to it. I'm sorry, we have to break. Did you have one special question that hasn't gotten to yet or something you wanted to ask, or have you gotten to all the prize ones? Well, I haven't gotten to all the prize ones. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to do here is draw the man who came out of nowhere, basically and with nothing, and in time became a famed actor, the governor of California, and eventually the president. So I guess what I'm striving for here is uh, your feelings and what you brought with you. What, that chair right now, what is in that chair that, that you lead this country with? Well, I think that we're all the product of everything that's happened in our lives. I and I suppose one of the things that when I think back, 
to those towns where I lived, uh, to that school, are all those people along the line, and in the years since, that uh, were willing to reach out a helping hand. This could be an advice and counsel. It could be the fact that I couldn't have gone to school if that little school so beset with its own financial problems had not made it possible for students like myself, because there were others in the same boat, to get an education. Uh, because the jobs were given by the school, the deferral of tuition, scholarships, and so forth, the, the help that you had. And then it went on to, like that man that gave me that audition in the, uh, in the studio, and on later years, uh, when I went to Hollywood, the, believe it or not, the kindly actors and actresses on the set with stars and well-established would go out of their way to uh, give you a lesson and give you advice and correct something that you were doing wrong or not doing enough of uh, in the work. And I like people. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Well, it's been a pleasure.